So this is a first video on a, on a hopefully a series of videos concerning vector calculus. This is a course that I'm presently tutoring at the University of Sydney, which is Math 2021. Vector calculus is one of these amazing subjects that has a lot of random bits of information. We'll learn about curl, we'll learn about different types of vector fields, we'll learn about arc length parameterizations and all this other stuff. We'll learn about Stokes theorem and Green's theorem and all these other ideas and linear algebra is going to pop up randomly and then it's going to go away without anyone really asking any questions. It's all fundamentally related and there's a beautiful unified perspective that can be had for vector calculus which then leads into the really fancy and enjoyable subjects like uh, Romanian geometry of which my PhD is in and students really miss out on this perspective probably because of time and the fact that you're not really at the level of mathematical maturity to understand all the significance of the theorems or even ask you know is this the right way of thinking about things you know most students don't get to that until they their PhDs but vector calculus has a very simple unified picture that I'd love to share and given that I know the more advanced material, the, the vector calculus in higher dimensions, namely Romanian geometry, you, I can transfer all those high, higher perspectives down to the naive vector calculus world of, of R2 and R3 and offer some very interesting insights on how to think about things like vector fields, like divergence, curl, and why all these things are related. And in fact, why the determinant will appear in computations of curve. People believe, and Grant Sanderson has done a good job to say that it's it's not just a memorization trick, this, this point on curl, but he misses a key point, which is the fact that curl arises because of a an important linear algebra property that basically illustrates the fact that we don't think about vector calculus in the right language. And this is one of the key stumbling blocks in terms of unifying everything together. We're fundamentally looking at vector fields incorrectly. And the point of this series of videos is to convey the right perspective. And in particular, I'm going to make a single video at the end of this series, which will be entitled Vector Calculus Done Right. And it's where we go through the entire series of videos in this new language and we learn how to unify all these perspectives. Okay, that's enough chit chat, let's get into it. So in this video, we're gonna look at three main ideas. We're gonna look at vector fields, so we're gonna define what a vector field is. We're gonna look at a very important class of vector fields, which will get us in touch with some further concepts in vector calculus. Namely, we're gonna look at conservative vector fields. And one of the beautiful things about having this animation program that Three Blue One Brown's Grant Sanderson has developed is that we can easily visualize and sketch vector fields. This is often a component that is typically omitted entirely just because there's no technology for it. So let's start with the definition of a vector field. So let D be a region in R2. So you can imagine like a, a disk or something of this nature. A vector field on this region is just gonna be a function which assigns to every point on this region a vector in R2. So the thing you wanna have in mind is, you know those weather maps that you see when you watch the weather, for example. Uh, every point on the map assigns the direction in which the wind or whatever it is, is going. For example, we can consider the vector field which is given by f of x, y. So we're inputting a point on the plane and we're outputting the vector minus y in the ith direction and x in the jth direction. So it's given by this somewhat rotational vector field here. If we consider the vector field f of x, y given by y plus sine x, we get the following. And if we consider the vector field given by f of x, y is 2x minus 3y plus 2x plus 3y, then we get the following. Now, we can also look at vector fields on regions in R3. That's what I was saying before. So if D is a region in R3, then a vector field is just a function which assigns to every point a vector in R3. So just to bring this point home again, the theory of vector fields on R2 and R3 can often be treated simultaneously. But since it's much easier to visualize vector fields on R2, we're going to focus on vector fields in R2. One of the main reasons why vector calculus is such an important subject is because vector fields in R3 are extremely important in physics. Newton's law of gravity, for example, 
states that the magnitude of the force between two objects, so let's say this smaller object of mass m and this larger object of mass big M, then the, the gravitational force, the magnitude of that, is given by some gravitational constant g times the product of the masses divided by the square of the radius, or the square of the distance between them, I should say. So let's assume that the object, the, the larger one, the object of mass m, is located at the origin. This will simplify our calculations. And the smaller object of mass little m is located at some point x, y, z, which we'll denote by bold x, in R3. The square of the distance between them is going to be given by the Pythagorean relation, so we'll have x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and that's just the square of the absolute value of x. And the gravitational force exerted on the object, the smaller one, of mass little m, acts towards the origin, and the unit vector in this direction is just given by x over mod x. And so we have a minus sign since it points towards the origin. So now the gravitational force acting on the object at x is then given by f of bold x is minus, again, the gravitational constant times the product of the masses divided by the absolute value or the distance between them, which is mod x squared, in the direction of this unit vector. So we have x over mod x. And this just simplifies to minus gmm over mod x cubed in the direction of x. So an important way of generating vector fields is via so-called potential functions. And the way in which we do this is by using an auxiliary vector, named we're going to introduce the grad vector and this is defined by being the coordinate partial derivative in the ith direction and the yth partial derivative in the j direction. So now if f from r2 to r or some subregion of r2 is a smooth function we can construct the associated gradient field which we'll denote by nabla f as the partial derivative of f in the x direction that'll be the ith component of the vector and the jth component of this vector will be the yth partial derivative of f. So let's look at an example of computing the grad of some function. So let f from r2 to r be given by f of xy is x squared y plus 3 sine y. We want to find grad of f, or the gradient field. So if we compute the x partial derivative, keeping y constant, we'll get 2xy. And if we compute the y partial derivative, keeping x constant, we'll have x squared plus 3 cosine y. Since grad is given by partial f, partial x in the i, and partial f, partial y in the j, we see that grad f is then 2xy in the ith component, and x squared plus 3 cos y in the jth component. Okay, just to bring this home, let's look at a second example. So let f from r2 to r be the function given by the square root of x minus ln of x plus y. We want to find the gradient field again. So we'll compute the partial derivative of f in the x direction. Differentiating the square root of x, we get 1 over 2 square root of x. Differentiating the logarithm, remember we just differentiate the inside and divide by what was in there to begin with, we get 1 over x plus y. Similarly, if we compute the y partial derivative, well the square root of x goes away, and we get minus 1 over x plus y. So now the grad vector, being the partial derivative of f in the x direction for the ith component, is 1 over 2 square root of x minus 1 over x plus y in the ith component. And then in the jth component, it's given by minus 1 over x plus y. So we have a fancy name for such vector fields. So a vector field which is given by the gradient of a function is called a conservative vector field. So a vector field f is said to be conservative if we can find a smooth function f, let's say from r2 to r, or r3 to r, such that f is equal to nabla f. So let's see if we can determine whether a vector field is conservative or not. So let's consider the vector field f of xy given by minus y in the ith component and x in the jth component. We want to see if that's conservative. Let's assume it's conservative, in which case we'd find that minus yi plus xj is given by partial f over partial x in the ith direction and partial f partial y in the jth direction. If we equate the components, that says that partial f over partial x is equal to minus y. So we've just equated the ith component there. And if we integrate both sides with respect to x, we see that f is given by minus the integral of y dx. 
And so in particular, f has to be minus xy plus some constant. Now, we have an expression for f, so let's differentiate that and check if it coincides with the jth component that we have up here. So if we differentiate with respect to y, we get minus x, the constant will differentiate to zero, but the jth component of our vector field is not minus x, it's x. And so in particular, f can't be conservative. Okay, let's look at another one. So determine if the vector field given by f of x, y is square root of y over x plus the square root of y in the ith direction plus one over two x root y plus y in the jth direction. Again, if f is conservative, we should be able to find a function f such that f is given by grad of f. And we'll do the same thing. So let's equate the i component, in which case we get partial f over partial x is root y over x plus root y. If we integrate both sides, then we get f is equal to minus the integral of root y over x plus root y dx. If you make a substitution or you happen to construct this example like I did, then you can see that f is equal to the natural log of x plus root y plus some constant. If you have any further questions, leave them in the comment section down below and I'll help you guys out. So we now have an expression for f like we did in the previous case. And so we now need to check if I differentiate this with respect to y, I need to get this jth component that I start with. So if we do that, we find that the partial derivative of f in the y direction is one half root y over x plus root y. But then we can rewrite that as one over two x root y plus y. And that coincides with what we have up here. So indeed, in this case, f is conservative with its potential function given by the natural log of x plus root y. So some remarks are worth making at this point. So we have a very easy formula or recipe for producing conservative vector fields. So if you give me a function, let's say from R2 to R, I can produce a conservative vector field by looking at the gradient vector applied to that. But if you give me a random vector field off the street or in the wild, it's unlikely that this vector field is gonna be conservative. Being conservative is quite restrictive as a condition. One way you can think about vector fields which are conservative as the vector fields which can be integrated to get smooth functions back. So you should think about this grad vector as like a derivative. And in fact, in these later videos that we make, I'll convince you that grad really is the derivative when you know the language that I claim you should know. Then the conservative vector fields are exactly those ones which are just given by f prime of x. So for vector fields which aren't conservative, there's a model that you really want to keep in mind. It's actually very very primitive which makes it kind of nice. If you think about traversing a unit circle in the plane, so we're, we have a circle and we're just moving along it in the plane, we're not allowed to come off the plane so we're confined to the plane itself, then I can look at the angle which is formed by the x-axis as I move around the circle. So I start at zero and then I go to pi and then three pi on two and two pi and so on. But as I reach there, I immediately jump back and get to zero again. So it's not a continuous function in the sense that we're used to. In fact, it's not continuous. But moreover, it's, it's indicating something else. It's indicating that the right way to think about this is instead that the angle function is defined over the plane, not in the plane. So it's better to think about the angle function as a helix or a spiral than to think about it as just going around in a circle over and over again. Vector fields which are conservative, meaning you can glue them together to get a function, can't have this property because functions live in the plane, not over the plane. What's okay. going on here is if a function has a spiraling phenomenon, if it's curling around and has this rotational factor, you can't glue it together. You can't glue it together to form a function. And that's going to be one of the most important observations you can make in bridging two very strange concepts that people tend not to bridge in their vector calculus courses. Namely, you'll learn that a conservative vector field has vanishing curl. Of course, we don't know what curl means yet, but we will in, in future videos. But not every vector field with vanishing curl is conservative. And so, the example you need to bear in mind when looking at vector fields which aren't conservative is exactly this spiraling phenomenon. 
So if a vector field has this spiraling property or tends to curl around, then it's not conservative. Indeed, recall that we showed that the vector field which was minus y in the ith direction and x in the jth direction is not conservative. And if we look at it, we see that it's spiraling around the origin. Okay, so to recap what we covered today, we looked at what a vector field was. Remember, it's just a function which assigns to every point on the plane a corresponding vector. Most of this theory that applies in R2 will apply without change to R3, and in fact, any dimension you want. We looked at many examples of vector fields, but we also looked at a class of vector fields that are gonna be very important, namely conservative vector fields those ones that are given by the grad of some smooth potential function. And we discussed that one of the obstructions to a vector field being conservative is that it has a spiraling phenomenon. So if it spirals, it's not going to be conservative. That's it for this video. If you liked it, please hit the like button and consider subscribing. And if you have any questions, definitely leave them down in the comment section below. That's the best way to get in contact with me. And I hope to see you guys in the next video.